Annie's heading to the town of Bramar, where George was born, to see if she can discover anything further about him and his parents. I'll just take a seat. Archivist Pete Wadley has been doing some research for her. You were interested at, uh, in the history of George Ferguson, who's your great-grandfather. So let's start right at the beginning with his birth. What we have here are the records of the Kirk Session of Braemar. What's, what's a Kirk Session? It's a meeting of a body who act like a court, and it's made up of the elders of the church, and they meet to discuss things that are going on in the local society. If you take a look here, we have Isabella McCarty appearing before the session. Isabella's uh, George's mother. It's George's mother, it's your great, great grandmother. She has been brought before the Kirk session um, to be admonished for the sin um, of having a child uh, out of wedlock. Oh. At this time, the Kirk was not just a place of worship. It also had the power to actively police the moral behavior of the community. The elders who made up Kirk sessions were leading members of the parish. Part of their remit was to investigate sexual transgressions, including illegitimate births. Proceedings began when the elders issued a summons to the mother, in this case Isabella McCarty, to force her to appear before them. She would sit here at the front of the church. The Kirk session would have gathered round a table. A minister would rise and would say, you are accused as an unmarried woman of bringing forth a child. Well, no, she would know these people. They're prominent members of her society. It's a small area. They would know her. And there is, a, there is an embarrassment or a stigma or a shame to, to, to having to appear and apologize for her behavior and then be censured um, and have, have the oh, it's her, terrifying. Her it's, 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 it's not a pleasant thing, no. um, but the church is responsible for the moral welfare of society and this is the way they deal with it at the time. Right. So, being interrogated, she declared that the father was William Ferguson, farm servant in the parish of Kettins. Okay, what's, what she, the story is here is that Isabella, who's from Braemar, had left Braemar and gone to this other parish, Kettins. She had a job for two years as a domestic servant, and that's where she met William Ferguson, and she's come home to have the baby. The Kirk session didn't just summon the mothers of illegitimate children, they also pursued the fathers to rebuke them and to seek financial support for the child. But in this case, there is no record that the Kirk managed to track down William Ferguson. So now that makes me really interested in Isabella because uh, here's a single mother with a child. Do we have any knowledge about Isabella? We know quite a lot about Isabella. Ah. We're very fortunate in that, in that way. Isabella's quite, quite interesting. She's back here again in front of the Kirk session oh, eight, no. years, eight years later. Oh. Oh, this what's is, happened this time? This is 1860. It's the same people. The, oh, they the, the same the, people. And here appearing before the meeting voluntarily. Okay, so Isabel McCarty confessing herself guilty of a relapse in fornication. Being solemnly admonished to adhere strictly to truth, she declared that Thomas Russell Watchmaker is the father of her pregnancy. She has another pregnancy. She does. Yeah. Eight years later. Right. With another man. Another man. In this case, okay. Thomas Russell. And he's a watchmaker. That guilt took place betwixt them in her mother's house at Tom and Towel in this parish. Mm. That guilt took place betwixt them only once. God, they're, no, they're, they're, they're into the specific, detail. Aren't they? Absolutely. <laughs> he had promised to marry her before guilt took place betwixt them. It's equivalent of being engaged, if you like. He had said he was going to marry her, and then guilt takes place. Right being asked if she had any writing from him of a promise of marriage, declared she had not, but that he told her uncle, George McCarty, and his wife, being solemnly admonished, she was dismissed for the present. She's pregnant by this man, Russell, now, but unlike Ferguson, what she's saying here is that he's promised to marry her. And not only has he done that, he's let it be known, and it lists some people, other members of your family, George McCarty, um, that he's going to marry her, and then he doesn't. What's quite interesting about this one is that she appeared voluntarily. 
everybody would have known that, that she's pregnant again. And she, I think she wanted it formally recorded that this isn't her fault. She had promises that uh, were broken. That, that were broken. That it's, it's Russell's fault. Right. She met somebody. She'd had this tryst with him. He told everybody they're going to get married. So she's thinking, oh great, I've got a future now, I've got a father from my other child. She must have been very pleased with this promise of marriage. Yeah. Um, but the marriage never took place. It never took place. This is Isabella's second child, Jane McCarty. Oh, it's, it's a girl. And she's listed as... Illegitimate. What's really interesting is this bit here. The cross. That's her mark. Her, oh, it says here, her mark. Her mark. She can't write. Ah. Uh. So when the Kirk session said, do you have something in writing from Thomas Russell, what good would it have been to her? She can't read it. Yes. So she's had two children, and both times she's, she's, been, she's been abandoned, as it were. She has. Isabella McCarty had two children, both illegitimate, and no husband to help her support either of them. We know that Isabella came back to this Kirk session to these same people um, for a third time. Don't, don't worry, it's not a third child. In this case, she comes back to ask for financial help, but she's not asking for financial help for herself. She comes back to ask if they will pay for George's education. Oh, okay. Now, that's quite interesting. She's illiterate herself. That's and right. And she clearly doesn't want her son, her son to have that difficulty. Yes. So she comes back to the church, despite the fact she's been sat here and been admonished twice by these people. She swallows her pride and she comes back and says, can you help educate my son? And they do. Wow. George Ferguson, for school fees, I think it must be seven shillings and sixpence. That's correct. So he's at school. And we know that Isabella makes sure that her daughter also has an education. Incredible. Education is a passport, in a way, to a better future. I believe Isabel absolutely gets how she important that, that is. Because yeah. you know, she hasn't even... had it herself. No. So do we know what happens to her next? We know she never applies for poor fund. The poor fund records exist for Braemar. Her name never appears on it. But she's always managed to get just enough to keep going and to see her children educated and perhaps point them yeah. for a, for, to, a, to a different, if, if not better, life. Tom and Towel seems to come up quite a bit here in the records. It, it does, yeah. yeah. What it's referring to is a farm called Tom and Towel, oh, I see. which is in Braemar, and it's, it's, it's a vital place in, in this story. And we're coming up to Tom and Towel. And to remind you, this is where your great-great-grandmother, Isabella, was born. It's where she retreated to when she fell pregnant with your great-grandfather, George. It's where that guilt took place with Russell and where her second child was born. And it's where she lived a great deal of her life. But I think this is the original stone and a spectacular view of a Braemar. Unbelievable. So uh, they're yeah. looking directly over Brimar. Yes, indeed. You can see the church. Yeah. Pete, do we have any information about what happened to Isabella later on in life? Yes, we do. If you look here, this is the 1881 census. Here she is, Isabel McCarty. She seems to be on her own. Yes. Living here. She's 51 and she's a poultry, poultry keeper. keeper. The 1891 census. 62 years old. Yes, indeed. She's still a poultry maid, living on her own. So that's 1891. We go to the next census, oh, right. 1901. She's 1901. now in her 70s. And I've just stopped to think that if this census goes up to 1901, yes. and my grandfather was born in 1896, yes. perhaps, he must have met his, his grandmother. Yeah. Maybe my grandfather came to this cottage to visit her, you know. And he was such a sweet-looking young boy and terribly nicely turned out. So I would imagine he, she would have been proud of him. And here she is living alone, this little old lady, and poultry, poultry maid. maid. She's still working yeah. in her 70s. Still hanging on in there. And then finally, here's the 1911 census. She's now in her 80s. Yeah. Isabella McCarty, living alone. She's aged 81, and she's a pensioner. Wow, I didn't know that they had um, the old age pension back That's in right. the day. That's right, they do. The old age pension comes in in Scotland in 1908. She's lived right into the modern era. It means she can stop being a poultry maid.
She died in, in 1913, so she died when she was 83. Uh, the cause of death is given as senile dementia, but really what we're talking about is old age. Mm. She's lived in this harsh environment for 83 years, and her death is reported by her son, your great-grandfather, George. It's quite a testimony to, to um, survival, isn't it, really? It's a tough cookie. Mm.